Most aviation fans know of the long lineage of World War II era piston engines this channel covers, as well as the blistering pace with which technology has progressed into what are today's ultra-efficient turbojets and turbofans. However, for a brief moment in history, these two propulsion technologies were combined into Frankenstein's monster of propulsive power, the motor jet. Before we get started today, I just wanted to thank all of you who've been tuning in here recently. In the past few weeks, we've seen some explosive growth on this channel, and we just wanted to thank all of you for tuning in. If you're new here, please consider subscribing so we can continue to grow the scope of our future projects. And with that out of the way, let's talk motor jets. In 1908, a man named René Loren posited the idea that a piston engine could be potentially used to power the compressor section of a jet engine. But that little tidbit of knowledge would be filed away for a few decades, only later to resurface in Italy in the 1930s, where a man named Secondo Campini began tinkering with what he coined the thermojet. But it wouldn't really be fair to suggest Mr. Campini only tinkered with that idea. No, instead he did the damn thing, and built the Comproni Campini N1, a motorjet-powered aircraft that debuted just after the Hinkle HE-178 as the second jet-powered aircraft to ever take flight. Now, at first, this aircraft, powered by this hybrid power plant, was lauded as a breakthrough in aviation technology. However, soon the world learned of the aircraft's lackluster performance, as well as the existence of the HE-178, which had been kept a secret but had flown a year earlier. That's not to say, however, that the problems with the N1 were necessarily inherent to the motor jet. The problem was, however, that the engine used a relatively small duct size that limited the mass flow and thus the propulsive efficiency of the engine. You see, in a motor jet, instead of a turbine section being used to harness the energy from the combustor and drive the compressor, as is the case with a conventional turbojet engine, the compressor section is driven by a piston engine, and the turbine or hot section can be, but isn't always, removed entirely. Now, in terms of weight, this is absolutely less efficient than a turbojet. But if you're at a point in history where metallurgy hasn't yet developed to the point that we can manufacture turbines that can withstand the incredible heat of a jet's exhaust, it's actually brilliant. Even more, motor jets actually provided greater thrust than a propeller alone, and because of their hybrid nature, they're more efficient at low altitudes and low speeds than a jet. So what gives? Why didn't we see more motor jets? Well, you can probably guess. They're terribly impractical to build and, well, just look at this thing. It's ridiculously inelegant. I mean, think about it. Let's build a device with thousands of parts to drive the compressor of a basic jet engine. It's ridiculous. But if I might also add, it's also really cool. However, despite the ludicrousness of the idea, several motor jets actually flew. As we've mentioned, the first was the N1. Specifically, the engine in the N1 featured a three-stage compressor located forward of the cockpit, which in turn was driven by a 900-horsepower liquid-cooled Isoda Fraschini engine. Interestingly, the air from the compressor section was first used to help cool the piston engine before being reintroduced with the engine's exhaust gases, thus recovering most of the heat energy from the piston engine that would have otherwise been wasted. After the air was remixed, it was ducted to the ring-shaped burner that then injected fuel into the gas flow and ignited it, sending it toward the exhaust nozzle. Of note is the fact that the 900 horsepower Fraschini did produce enough thrust for the N1 to fly without activating the jet section, which essentially made it a ducted fan with an afterburner. However, as we said, the small duct size limited airflow to the point in which propulsive efficiency was poor and thus, both the N1 and the motor jet failed to thrive. In the Pacific theater, the Japanese Navy had turned to kamikaze tactics in an effort to turn the tides of the war in the face of the approaching U.S. forces. These tactics gave rise to purpose-built aircraft expressly designed for the purpose of suicide bombing, such as the MXY-7 Oka or Cherry Blossom. Now, at first, I thought this was a pretty euphemistic name, but having since learned that cherry blossoms frequently represent the short but colorful life of samurais, perhaps it's not. 
In any case, the Oka was a manned flying bomb that was typically carried beneath a Mitsubishi G4 M2E Model 24J Betty bomber until it was within about 20 miles of its intended target, at which point it would disconnect from its transport, start its solid rocket motors, and accelerate up to 620 miles per hour in a dive toward the target. This soon became a problem, however, as 20 miles from a target was well within the range of carrier-based defending aircraft, and as such, the bombers were incredibly vulnerable and frequently intercepted. As such, the Model 22 Oka was revised with, you guessed it, a Campini-type motor jet engine, the Ishikawajima TSU-11. 50 aircraft were built with this power plant variant, and the first flight took place in June of 1945. However, none appear to have been used operationally, and only 20 TSU-11 engines were ever produced. The TSU-11 used a four-cylinder inverted inline Hitachi Hatsukazi Toku Model 13 piston engine to drive its compressor. The Toku itself was a licensed-built version of the German Hurt HM504. Today, a single example of the TSU-11 engine still exists in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and in 1997, it was installed into the example Oka-22 during its restoration. By the end of the war, the Soviets were aware that essentially everyone involved in the conflict except for them had begun work on either advanced jet or rocket projects. As such, the State Defense Committee ordered their aircraft manufacturers to expeditiously begin work on a project of their own. In an attempt to produce something effective as quickly as possible, Mikoyan Gurevich chose to fully develop the VRDK booster engine that had been slowly developing in the background since 1942. In the case of the VRDK, the compressor section was driven by a 1650 horsepower Kilma VK107R V12 piston engine. After takeoff, a clutch at the end of the crankshaft could be engaged, which in turn drove a step up gearbox with a 13 to 21 ratio into an extension shaft that powered the compressor. Similar to the Caproni, inlet duct air was routed over the engine's oil cooler, but the water radiator was behind the compressor to maximize airflow over it. Additionally, a secondary air duct led from the main duct to the VK107's turbo supercharger, so that when the booster was running, this second duct delivered additional air, which boosted the piston engine to 2,500 horsepower. All this sounds great in theory, however, the VRDK was limited to only 10 minutes' time with its jet portion active. Between the three-bladed propeller and the motor jet booster, the aircraft operated similarly to a piston-driven aircraft with an equivalent of 2,800 horsepower while weighing only 6,166 pounds. As such, the aircraft had an impressive top speed of 510 miles per hour, even if it was only capable of such feats for a limited time. So why don't we see more motor jets today? Well, because they've fallen out of favor due to their complexity and how, in general, they were viewed as impractical. However, as transport category aircraft look toward the future for ways to become more fuel efficient, a second look at what is now called the compound cycle engine has resurfaced. In 1995, Rolls-Royce filed a patent in which they tried to combine the inherent thermal efficiency of internal combustion engines with the advantages in power to weight ratio inherent to turbine engines. According to the patent, the disadvantage of the motor jet is the requirement for the fan to be mechanically linked to the output shaft of the engine, which necessitates the use of a gearbox between the two. The requirement of this gearbox harms the bottom line of the engine in terms of power to weight ratio. Also, the motor jet engine NASA had proposed in the 80s featured a common shaft between the fan and turtle combustion engine compressor and turbine, which, the patent states, will surely give rise to aerodynamic mismatching, which would lead to compressor handling problems, particularly compressor surges. In the Rolls-Royce patent, the motor portion of the motor jet is actually entirely independent from the shaft comprising the main fan and turbine. The engine is, however, connected to the compressor. This supposedly eliminates the issues surrounding aerodynamic matching, as the sections are mechanically independent. However, despite these innovations, we've yet to see Rolls-Royce do anything with the patent. We have, however, seen another company, MTU, Germany's leading engine manufacturer, publish a paper called A Composite Cycle Engine Concept for Year 2050. In their paper, they describe a motor jet in which they've combined the modern geared turbofan with motor jet technology to increase fuel efficiency. In their design, the fan connects to a gearbox, as is the case with modern geared turbofans, and it then connects to a low-pressure compressor, which in turn connects to the low-pressure turbine. In the high-pressure section, however, the high-pressure compressor and the high-pressure turbine are both on the same shaft as two V10 four-stroke engines. Another variant, which added an intercooler for the piston engine, was also studied. In their conclusion, they discovered that a compound cycle engine would decrease fuel burn by about 10% when compared to a geared turbofan engine, and by using an intercooler in combination with this layout, that number increased further to a 12.5% advantage. One of the biggest trade-offs, however, is the added weight. In the MTU proposal, the added trade-off is essentially a substantial increase in weight for a moderate increase in fuel efficiency. 
essentially because internal combustion engines are more thermally efficient. That is, for each unit of heat added to the engine in the form of burnt fuel, more work is completed. Adding them to the jet increases overall efficiency. However, because piston engines must contain their explosive energy, unlike a turbine engine, they tend to be extremely heavy. So, while it may be more efficient in theory to create a compound cycle engine, it remains to be seen whether the weight penalty will be worthwhile. Once again, thanks again for tuning in to Flight Dojo. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time.